so again, thank you all for joining us here tonight. Uh, tonight is a visit with the Peabody Essex Museum. Uh, and the uh, subtitle is Women Who Revolutionized Fashion. So I'm very excited tonight to be joined by Petra Slinkard, who's the Nancy B. Putnam Curator of Fashion and Textiles and Director of uh, cur cur oh boy, there, there I go. Uh, curatorial Affairs at the Peabody Essex Museum as she walks through the museum's upcoming exhibition, Made It, The Women Who Revolutionized Fashion. And I'll just note that uh, this actually um, uh, is not available to the public until November 21st. It runs from November 21st through March 14th. So you're getting a sneak peek. Uh, made It uh, showcases more than 100 works spanning 250 years, recognizing women's often overlooked contributions to the fashion and design industry. From Mary Todd Lincoln's seamstress to Elsa Schriparelli and Gabriel Coco Chanel to experimental labels like Chromat, I'm probably mispronouncing half these words. Women designers have transcended genres and revolutionized ideas of identity. Made It features show-stopping ensembles, street fashion, ready-to-wear, uh, oh boy, that uh, illuminate issues of representation, creativity, consumption, uh, transculturation, and distinctiveness, which have, in, which have and continue to impact the fashion industry. And as I mentioned, the Tewksbury Public Library has partnered with area museums, aquariums, and zoos to host virtual learning opportunities every Thursday night from September through November 19th. Uh, the Museum, Aquarium, and Zoo Events Virtual Learning Series is brought to you with federal funds provided by the Institute of Museum and Library Services and administered by the Mass Board of Library Commissioners. So all uh, 36 of us uh, joining here uh, live, and I'm sure the hundreds that will be watching on demand, let's give a big round of applause to Petra for joining us here tonight. And Petra, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, okay, great. Um, well, first it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am grateful to the Tewksbury um, Library for inviting me. And as Robert mentioned to you, this is a sort of a precursor uh, to an exhibition that we are opening um, at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts on November 21st. So we're about a week out. Um, so I will preface uh, that some of the installation shots that you will see um, are still in progress. So you'll probably see things like paper on the floor or um, hang tags on the mannequins, which is a way in which we organize um, mannequins um, or kind of keep track of them as we're dressing them. Um, and I'm also very uh, interested in, you know, answering any questions that I can at the end. Um, but as something, uh, you know, pops into your head, please do drop it into the chat so we can keep track of it. Um, and I'm happy to kind of revisit any slides, uh, you know, if that is helpful to us in our discussion as well. So without further ado, I will um, begin our presentation. Um, and let's see. There we go. So the first thing I should note is that this is actually um, a partnership between the Peabody Essex Museum and the Kunstmuseum in The Hague in the Netherlands. Um, the Kunstmuseum up until about last year was referred to as the Gemeente Museum or the City Museum of um, The Hague. And this is a really um, sort of serendipitous partnership that came about as I was scrolling through social media and um, sort of lamenting the fact that I had uh, planned on doing an exhibition dedicated to women fashion designers um, in my previous job, which was in Chicago at the Chicago History Museum. Um, but my life changed. I moved to Salem, Massachusetts to become the fashion and textile curator there. And I sort of put that idea to rest until one day in 2018, as I said, I was scrolling through social media and saw that the curator at the Kunst Museum had posted an image of a stack of books with the bindings showing. And I noticed that all of the names on the bindings were of um, women. And the hashtag that she used was strong women in fashion. 
And so I reached out to her and I said, you know, what is the show? What are you, what is happening here? Um, and she uh, told me that she was planning a show. Um, this is an image of the opening of their installation, which was called Femme Fatales, um, Sterke Frauen in the Mode, which translate essentially to strong women in fashion. And um, this was a show that was drawn almost entirely of their permanent collection um, with a few uh, specific loans from fashion houses such as Christian Dior, Vivian Westwood, and Stella McCartney. So I had the opportunity to go to the Netherlands to see the show um, and it was pretty fantastic. Um, and their entire show though was very much um, centered on the idea of protest in fashion um, and around the Women's March that took place in 2017. And so while I was interested in partnering with them, I knew that it was very important to um, an American audience that we um, sort of beef up our American story. And so they were quite gracious um, and continue to be as partners. And so not only are they letting us borrow 60 pieces from their permanent collection, but we're augmenting with 25 pieces from the PEMS collection, uh, three pieces from the MFA's collection. And I'm very excited that you get to hear from the MFA next week. This is kind of a nice uh, bookended experience, I think, in thinking about women um, as makers. Uh, two pieces from the Chicago History Museum and two private collectors. Um, we also partnered on a book, uh, which, you know, since this is a library program, I felt like it was relatively appropriate to plug our publication, um, which is a partnership with Rizzoli Electra. And that is um, titled The Women Who Revolutionized Fashion 250 Years of Design. So the Kunst Museum's um, exhibition essentially started um, around this idea that, as I said, in 2017, it was sort of a banner year for women in fashion and women in design. And one of the people who was really leading that charge is the designer who created this collection. Um, and this collection is from 2017, the spring summer collection. This is the runway example. And this is from the House of Dior. And the designer for the House of Dior currently, but um, in 2017, it was her inaugural year at Dior, is uh, Maria Grazia Churi. And she said uh, of taking over the House of Dior, I measure the tremendous responsibility of being the first woman in charge of a house so deeply rooted in the pure expression of femininity. I cannot wait to express my own vision. Um, she became the first woman creative director of the House of Dior in 2017, um, which is essentially a house that is known for its ultra feminine clothing, yet for 70 years exclusively only men directed that house. So to mark that turning point, Tree emblazoned a simple slogan t-shirt with the title of a manifesto on equality by the Nigerian author, um, Shimanda Nogoshi Adichie, and that is from uh, essentially it derived from uh, a TED talk that she gave um, entitled We Should All Be Feminists. So if I go back to that previous slide, you can see that that is indeed what is um, emblazoned on that t-shirt. And if we look at the ensemble a little bit closer, you'll also notice that the skirt, which is heavily um, ornamented with um, crystals and glass beads, which is very classic Dior, but it is um, uh, embroidered on a very sheer fabric, um, which then actually showcases the boy shorts uh, that are worn underneath the skirt. So again, kind of playing with this tension um, of what is femininity, what is masculinity, and how would those elements combine to create this un new uniform. So the shirt itself provides a clear statement on Shuri's new direction for the brand and subsequently became a call to arms. So made it as an installation, as an exhibition, really um, seeks to uh, recognize, reveal, and celebrate the many women who radically impacted Western fashion. Um, and I think that as I'm sharing my screen, this means that you can see our faces, right? Yes, okay, so I'm gonna try to move, I'm gonna hide you so you can see my full screen. Okay. Um, and so the two tenets of our exhibition are simply women impacted all areas of the fashion industry, including design, manufacturing, distribution, retail, and advertising. 
And that the stories of these designers in the last 250 years essentially parallels the history of women's struggle for equality. And so this is just one installation shot where we sort of take this notion of, you know, what it means um, for fashion to be used almost as a catalyst for change. Um, but from the opening, which we really open with that Christian Dior, we should all be feminist um, moment, we then immediately take you back. Um, we take you back to the 18th century. Um, this is an in, uh, a view from the Kunstmuseum's installation, and you can see that they got rather cheeky uh, with it, with this um, guillotine in the center. And I know the image is a little hard to read, but this is a basket full of heads. Um, and you will note that he is the only man um, or male ensemble featured in this installation. Um, but of course, as a European institution, the Kunstmuseum is quite fortunate to have um, a plethora of really wonderful, beautiful 18th century gowns, um, which is something that is relatively rare for US institutions. So we are um, borrowing five ensembles from the Kunstmuseum that represent um, this particular time period. And what is so significant about this particular time period is that this is um, really leading us into our first section of the exhibition, which is titled Breaking In. Um, you can see from the ensembles that it's really the fabric that is the most significant um, component. And maybe because of our standards today, we would look at the cut and um, the assemblage of the ensembles and think, well, that's quite ornate and intricate as well. And that is very true. However, it is truly about the fabric. And so what happened um, during this period is that there was a very rigid guild system in place. And that guild system was essentially um, run by male tailors. And the reason for that is because the wealth of an ensemble like this is really, as I said, in the fabric. And so it was thought that only a man with a steady hand um, could be talented enough, could be skilled enough to handle um, that precious commodity, that, that beautiful sumptuous textile. And that once the fabrics were cut, then they were sort of ushered off to women um, whose hands were smaller, whose dexterity was perhaps nimbler um, to essentially put uh, the pieces together or assemble the pieces. And so there was this built-in hierarchy where you had you know, the, the revered tailors and the lowly seamstresses. Um, and women started to fight back. Um, they started to realize and recognize their worth um, in essentially being able to put these ensembles together um, to you know, apply their own aesthetic to the clothing. Um, and as the, the comment on the page says, you know, as competition in the trade grew, women sought out and gained new positions. And so as we move through the exhibition, um, I will have punctu or punctuated our presentation um, with quotes that are used throughout the exhibition. So such as this one by Ida B. Wells, the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. And throughout the exhibition, this is really kind of one of the, the subtler um, consistencies that we really tried to use as our guiding light in creating this exhibition. And so then that takes me to two individuals that you see on the screen. On the left hand side, the woman is a woman named Elizabeth Keckley. Um, and on the right is a gentleman named Charles Frederick Worth. Well, Elizabeth Keckley was born in the United States in 1818, and it may be a name that you've heard more often in the last year or so than maybe ever before. But Elizabeth Keckley was born into slavery, um, and she was uh, taught by her mother how to sew and was quite a gifted uh, seamstress. She relied on her skills as a dressmaker. Um, she, she faced a, a, a pretty horrific life. She was sexually assaulted. She um, bore a, a child out of wedlock. Um, she was sort of bounced around from um, one owner within a family to another, and finally ended up in St. Louis, where the family with whom she lived um, relied almost solely on her dressmaking skills to keep them afloat. Um, but because she was so revered as a seamstress, 
um, she was essentially able to gain additional jobs on the side. Her clients were very loyal to her. And so they would provide her with extra money. And so essentially she was able to um, eventually purchase her own freedom and that of her sons. And upon purchasing her freedom, she immediately departed St. Louis and moved to Washington, DC. Um, and that is where she then occupied the highest rank in American fashion when she became the dressmaker and personal dresser for First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln. She also simultaneously founded the Ladies Freedom and Soldiers Relief Association, which provided food, shelter, and support to recently freed people, sick and wounded soldiers. And later, after she left the White House, she eventually made her way to Wilberforce University, the nation's first established, owned, and operated university by Black leaders, where she then continued to teach women the art of sewing. And the reason that I have these two individuals juxtaposed to one another is because Charles Frederick Worth, who was an Englishman who moved to Paris, um, was known, has been known in almost every fashion history book. Um, he is known as the father of haute couture. And I'm sorry, my screen's a little bit cut off here, um, but he designed for people on the, you know, the French courts. Um, he designed for the highest echelon of European society. But what you see on the left is an image of First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln. And the reason that I juxtapose these two individuals together is because it's sort of, it's, it's, it's fascinating and also extremely sad that here we have this man who absolutely did revolutionize the industry in his own right, has continued to be touted as the father of a couture, where essentially his peer, an ocean away, Elizabeth Keckley, who was designing for our highest court, his name has been all but forgotten. So as we move through the exhibition, um, again, we sort of punctuate the experience with um, facts and figures about women's history, social history, um, and industry history. So here you can see in 1848, the Women's First Rights Convention was held in Seneca Falls, New York, which launched the women's suffrage movement in the United States. Between 1890 and 1900, the number of women working outside of the home rose from 3.7 to 5.3 million in the United States. And by 1908, more than 15,000 women marched to New York demanding higher pay, shorter work hours, voting rights, and the abolition of the abolishment of child labor. So you can start to see how the fashion industry serves women who are working in the United States as an opportunity to start to push back to start to have a say. Um, and they leverage their positions within this industry in order to do so. And so this is another installation shot. So Robert mentioned um, Elsa Scaparelli. So here, um, I don't know if you can see my arrow. This is um, a work from Elsa Scaparelli from the 1930s featuring her circus collection. Um, this is a classic Chanel suit, but we also have designers in this section um, such as Jean Lavan. And so one of the people who is focused in this section is actually um, a, a Bay Stater, if you will, someone from uh, Boston. Um, and this is Maria Theresa Baldwin Hollander, who was the wife of Louis P. Hollander. And Baldwin started as a dressmaker in Boston on Boylston Street. And after her husband's business failed, he was a furrier, um, she essentially uh, carried the income of the family and he then joined forces with her um, and then eventually their two sons also joined forces with them um, and this is pretty extraordinary because not only at a time when you know women typically um, advertised under their husband's names or would turn over their income um, to men, Maria Teresa Baldwin was able to work independent of her husband until he joined her company. Um, and again, as a reminder, only joined her company because his company had failed. So you can see that the LP Hollander is actually for Louis P. So it does eventually take on his name, but Maria Teresa Baldwin does continue to serve as the creative director until her death. 
Then we have within the gaining momentum um, section, uh, a moment where we talk about Jean Paquin. And Paquin is an interesting story because she was the first um, major female couturier in Paris to open a shop in the 1890s. She grew her house situated among her male competitors um, into one of the largest in Paris. And probably one of the most interesting um, aspects of her history is that by 1917, a board of her male peers elected her president of the Chambre de Syndicale de la Couture, which is the association that governed and set the practices and the standards for the French haute couture industry. And juxtaposed with Jean Bacquin, we have American designers such as Sally Milgram. Well, Sally Milgram also designed in the 1930s, and she um, essentially started her career at the age of 17. She married when she was 16 and joined her husband's business at age 17 and became um, the in-house designer. She specialized in evening wear and soon became a favorite of First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. In fact, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt wore um, a Sally Milgram dress to the 1933 inauguration. Um, but of course, during the depression, um, you know, people in the United States could not necessarily afford the kind of um, high-end clothing that Sally Milgram, uh, the company, was known for. And so Sally herself um, started to think more creatively and more innovatively and more um, and thinking about equity and inclusion, um, created a line called Sally Mill, M-I-L. Um, and that was essentially a budget conscious line that provided women um, with fashionable alternatives during the economic crisis. Um, another contemporary in this section is that of Hattie Carnegie. Hattie Carnegie is a contemporary of Sally Milgram and she um, came to the United States as a young child, as an immigrant um, from Austria. And while she was thinking about who she wanted to be, she essentially asked someone, you know, who was the most wealthy and the most successful person in the United States? And someone, of course, told her, well, that's Carnegie after all. So in, in a practice of sort of, you know, uh, if you say it, uh, if you build it, you know, it will be, she changes her name to Carnegie. Um, Hattie Carnegie herself was not necessarily a seamstress, but she was a brilliant businesswoman um, and hired a lot of talented people to work for her. She also was one of the first people to have a regular column in Vogue where she essentially, for you know, to borrow from today's vocabulary, became a fashion influencer. Um, this is the close up of the Scaparelli dress that I showed you in our installation, um, and a few pieces that were next to the Scaparelli by Jean Lanvin. Um, here's another example as well from the late 1930s, 1940s. Um, and then, of course, as I mentioned at the outset of this um, discussion, that you know, while the Kunst Museum has a wonderful selection of um, European designs and did include a few American designers in their initial display, it was very important to me that we continued to um, dig into American history as both a reflection of what was going on in um, women's history and social history, but also to um, properly give credit and recognition to the pioneers of the American fashion industry. And so what you see across the screen is an image of Claire McCardell on the cover of Time Magazine, um, an image of Anne Lowe, who um, is probably best known for designing the wedding dress of Jacqueline Kennedy, an image of Bonnie Cashin, um, whose name you may not know, but if you ever have seen or carried a coach bag and you're familiar with the turnkey closure on a coach bag, that is a Bonnie Cashin original design. Um, and on the far uh, right here is an image of Frankie Welch, who was a favorite of First Lady Betty Ford. Um, but you can see on Frankie Welch's ensemble, which I think you can see my arrow is here. Um, she was of, um, she self-describes of being 
of Cherokee origin. Um, and probably one of her most successful designs was that of the Cherokee alphabet. Um, and so in thinking about who these pioneers were of American fashion design or essentially American sportswear, um, Clara McCardle probably being the most well known, um, you know, she's quoted here as saying, I've often wondered why clothes had to be delicate, why they couldn't be practical and sturdy as well as feminine. Um, and one of the things that, you know, I think that really stands out to me about this particular section on on the American look is how in today's fashion there is so much that we essentially take for granted, such as pockets and purses. Um, McArdle was um, very keen on including what um, you can see more detail here in this photograph, which was front closures. So enabling a woman to get dressed with ease um, and with comfort without necessarily having to need the assistance of someone to you know, get them in or out of clothing. And so again, in our 21st century thinking, you know, where a lot of people simply go to work in yoga pants, um, you know, I think it's a little bit uh, so bizarre for us to think that these um, you know, ideas were really revolutionary, but they absolutely were. And these women are the founders of American sportswear. Then our exhibition essentially takes us into a new direction where we talk in four categories about these idea of seismic shifts. So silhouette or the cut and the style and the outline of a garment um, essentially becoming the representation of moments in fashion history, social history, and women's history. And of course, we would be remiss without um, discussing uh, the flapper, which I have in quotations because I think it's very important to note that not all women in the 1920s were flappers. Not all women in the 1920s were wearing you know, short dresses um, and showing off their legs, but it absolutely was um, an emblem of the popular culture among younger people. It certainly became a symbol of women's um, liberation as they gained the right to vote in 1920. And so if we pause and go back and think about, it was in 1848 that the Seneca Falls Convention um, began kicking off the suffrage movement. It was not until 1920 that women gained the right to vote there was certainly cause uh, for celebration. And of course the image on the left is sort of a classic example of that flapper style. And then as we move into the 1930s, as the depression takes on, um, takes a hold of the United States economy and the world economy, um, we start to see a more glamorous, a more um, sinuous, a more mature look take hold. Um, and then uh, here are two examples from the show. On the left is a 1920s uh, dress by the Parisian house Jenny. Um, and this is from the Peabody Essex Museum collection. Um, the Jenny house is actually a, a relatively rare house, um, but Jenny did a wonderful job of um, designing for just that kind of woman. The woman who was on the town, the woman who was dancing, um, the woman who was really embracing um, the liveliness of the moment and that sort of athletic mobile um, figure. Uh, and so she was very popular. This was a very popular house among American women. And then juxtaposed with that, we have a, an example of an evening dress by um, Madeleine Vionnet, who is a, a Parisian um, couturier, who is probably best known for perfecting what is known as the bias cut. So in looking at this particular dress, you can see these lines in the dress. Um, you can also see this cascading drape here to the front of the garment. This is essentially due to that technique, um, cutting fabric on the bias. So fabric has a warp and a weft, which you know, for all intents and purposes could be viewed as a grid. Um, and when you cut along the warp or the weft, the fabric will respond differently. But if you turn that fabric at a 45 degree angle and you cut along that line, you're creating um, essentially more of a drape and um, a more subtle and softer hand to the fabric. And this is essentially what really helped produce those beautiful sinuous looks of the 1930s. Um, and then two other sections that we discuss in relationship to silhouette is um, the evolution of swimwear and also that of the miniskirt. And in the evolution of swimwear, 
And this is an interesting uh, way to track fashion. Um, so with the swimwear, you know, even as early as the 1920s, we were still wearing very heavy wool, itchy, um, sort of cumbersome bathing suits. Um, and it really was in about the 1940s, 1950s, where we have designers like Rosemary Reed, who you see her on the left-hand side fitting her model, Tina Leeser and Carolyn Scherner, who evolved swimwear styles from the saggy itchy wool tunics um, into functional fashionable sportswear designed for active stylish women. Um, Reed, who you see featured here in particular, advocated for swimwear to move beyond um, just an athletic uniform and for manufacturers to recognize that women had different figures. She fought to combine the utility of foundation wear and the allure of evening wear to create bathing suits that would function and flatter. Um, and of course, the work of these designers um, also sort of helped usher in a new style of sort of playful photography with models um, and advertisements in magazines such as Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, and Life. Um, and in looking at the mini skirt, you know, one designer who, of course, is probably best known for that is for that particular style is Mary Quant, um, which you see here an example of um, on the right hand side. And Mary Quant, you know, is is quoted as saying, you know, it wasn't me or Courage, who was her peer, um, Andre Courage, who invented the miniskirt. It was the girls in the streets who did it. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting point to make here because this is also a turning point when fashion starts to take on a life of its own. Um, this whole notion of fashion trends kind of trickling up from the streets, um, trickling up from that youth quake um, movement. You know, this is um, when the people really start to take hold of, you know, how they want to be presented, um, what is necessary to be worn for their specific life and their specific lifestyles. Um, and let me move forward. And this is an installation shot of those same bathing suits that you see here. So we have a Tina Lisa, a Rosemary Reed, and a Carolyn Scherner here. And this is an installation shot from um, our in progress uh, exhibition. Um, and this is an installation shot from our 1960s section. And you can see here this bag over the mannequin's head. Um, this is uh, when the lights are on and we're working with the mannequins um, or they're you know, on hold, we always cover them up in order to try to um, minimize the amount of light uh, that they would receive. Um, this piece here in the center is a 1965 Mary Mecco design, um, which came uh, from design research in Cambridge. The Mary Mecco brand, of course, has a really close relationship to our particular area. Um, it was founded in 1951, um, but the company of design research um, was founded not too far after that and was the exclusive distributor of Mary Mecco designs in the United States um, for quite some time. I don't get my inspiration from books or paintings. I get it from the women that I meet, which is a quote by the Venezuelan designer, Carolina Herrera. And this takes us into our next section, which is essentially about making choices. Um, and so, as I said, uh, this is um, an area where we really start to delve exclusively into the 20th century. Um, so here you see an example of maternity wear um, by a Dutch house uh, from the 1970s. Um, here with the midriff showing is a contemporary design by Anne de Mulemeester. What you see here in the center um, is a 1940s design by the Parisian house Carvan who really specialized in creating clothing for petite women. So again, kind of thinking about women as real people and not as mannequins, um, thinking about uh, their sizes in a variety of forms. Um, this beautiful pantsuit by the French designer, Sonia Riquiel. And then of course your classic um, Diane von Furstenberg uh, wrap dress from 1974. And so again, thinking about the way in women, uh, the way in which women are starting to lay claim um, to their own bodies, their own presentation of self and the way that they perceive themselves within society. 
So Diane von Furstenberg says, you know, it's not about, it is about freedom and power and confidence. And it is really all about empowering women. And that is what I hope my legacy is. She created the wrap dress in 1974, which was the garment that sealed her status as an industry mogul and a fashion icon. Constructed of lightweight form-fitting jersey and available in a dizzying array of colors and patterns. It's timeless, flattering design felt equally at home in the office or at the nightclub. Um, and then this is another scene which is a part of a subsection of that making choices scene. And as you can see, we've, we've created or to the best of our ability, um, are hinting at this idea of a, a crosswalk. Um, initially, we had toyed with putting a, a photo mural in the background of a busy Madison Avenue intersection. Um, but this really kind of hones in at this idea of women in the workforce, you know, joining the workforce en masse, um, particularly in the mid 20th century. So if you were ever a fan of the show um, Mad Men, um, you know, thinking about, you know, this army of women kind of marching to work um, to take on their roles in this new modern and contemporary era. Um, two designers like Donna Karen, who in 1984, um, created her first collection, um, which was entitled Seven Easy Pieces. And Donna Karen essentially was really sort of taking us into the first real notion of what we might now call a capsule collection. So thinking about streamlining a woman's wardrobe because she was busy um, essentially being a mother, uh, you know, being a wife, um, you know, working um, a full-time job, potentially being a CEO. And here you can even see um, Donna Karen was proposing that she would become president. Um, and so here is an example that is on view in our um, installation on the left-hand side uh, from 19, I'm sorry, I said 1984, I meant 1985. And um, the uh, selection of sort of this idea of the capsule collection and the idea of, you know, being able to go from morning um, and noon into night. Two avant-garde designers such as um, Rei Kawakuba for the Japanese um, line Comme des Garçons. Comme des Garçons essentially translates into like the boys. And um, Rei Kawakuba uh, is a really wonderful designer. She uh, has consistently thought outside the box um, in regard to her own practice and to her own designs. Um, and the quote that we use in the exhibition to exemplify her is that, I make clothes for women who don't follow what their husbands think. Um, and on the left-hand side is the work from our um, collection that will be on view. And on the right-hand side, um, you can see the runway ensemble on the model. Um, Robert mentioned the term Chromat. Um, Chromat is an American sportswear um, and swimwear company um, based in New York and in Miami, Florida. And Chromat's design, um, which is founded by um, Becca McCarran Tran, Tran. Um, she trained as an architect, um, but essentially became very interested in clothing design. And um, is very, the whole concept behind Chroma is that it is a very body positive brand. Um, she designs for all people, all shapes, all sizes, um, and from all backgrounds. And one of the pieces that we have in the show is from this um, collection, which is her wet uh, jet collection which was a collaboration that she did with a contemporary photographer by the name of Dana Scruggs. And you can see that um, Chromat in the 21st century is essentially taking that notion of like the wet t-shirt contest or the wet t-shirt um, and reappropriating it for use in her, in her bathing suits and in her clothing and kind of reclaiming that idea of the gaze upon a woman's body. So we really start to see um, this evolution in women, you know, taking hold of the way in which they are perceived and presented. Um, and then our final uh, section is this idea of design acting as a catalyst for change. Um, I mentioned that the Kunstmuseum um, was very inspired by the 2017 Women's March. Um, and another designer in the show who was also very inspired is that of Carla Fernandez. Um, Carla Fernandez is based in Mexico. And this is um, one of three pieces um, from her 
a collection called Fashion as Resistance. And here it says produ production without oppression, um, which is on the center of the jumpsuit. And on the left-hand side, it says, yes, ooh, Yes, I dream of a better world. Should I dream of a worse on the right hand side? And this was specifically made to be worn at the Women's March. So you can see that we've included a protest sign here in the background um, that is blank. And that is specific because the ensemble that you see in front of it is sort of like a walking, breathing protest sign. Um, we also plan to include a moment um, where it's sort of a moment of self uh, reflection and sort of a, a philosophical moment where we pose the question to people, you know, what would your sign say? Because we cannot assume what are important issues to anyone, but clearly the, um, you know, the history of using signage to make a point from everything from suffrage to the civil rights movement, um, to animal rights, um, to, you know, the 2017 Women's March, um, it has been a, a, a commonality in our history and process. Um, here are two pieces, uh, the left on the left-hand side um, by Vivian Westwood and on the right-hand side by Zandra Rhodes. Um, so again, kind of pushing boundaries, you know, thinking about uh, appropriating aspects of street culture. So on the left-hand side, you can see the print on the skirt um, was a is the result of a collaboration that Vivian Westwood did with the street artist, um, graffiti artist Keith Herring. And on the right-hand side, Zandra Rhodes really pulling from and taking um, her cue from um, you know, punk culture, this collection entitled Conceptual Chic. Um, here we have a quote by Anne de Mulemeester, the ideas that garments are alive is a big inspiration. Um, I want to fill them with soul. So whenever possible, we really tried to privilege the voice of the designers in this exhibition. Um, we certainly didn't want to claim to know what they were thinking um, or what their design inspiration was. And so whenever possible, we lead with their voices. Um, and I sort of, I will conclude um, with this last designer, which is a recent acquisition to PEMS collection. If you're familiar with the Peabody Essex Museum's collection, um, you know that we have a, a very strong um, Native American um, collection. And in sort of building on a tradition that was laid by my colleague, Karen Kramer, who did an exhibition in 2015 entitled Native Fashion Now, we are building our Native American fashion collection. Um, and the orange dress that you see on the left is a recent acquisition to our collection. It was a purchase by the designer directly, who you see on the right-hand side, who is Jamie Akuma, who is a Lusueño Shoshana Bannock designer. Um, and you probably might know Jamie Akuma's works um, for her um, very detailed, beautiful, vibrant beadwork. Um, but she also designs um, with sustainability in mind and definitely um, has made uh, quite a bit of progress uh, since the founding of her company. And then we conclude the show um, essentially where we began. So within um, the context of the exhibition, uh, when we have detailed didactics, we include quotes from the designers, we include portraits from the designers, again, trying to give them as much presence um, throughout the installation as possible. And that is all I have for you. Um, thank you, first and foremost, for your time and your attention. Um, and I'd love to open it up now for questions. And so I'm going to try to find the, uh, I guess I could go here to the chat and then I will also try to pull up all of your faces. Um, so let me go through the chat first and just see what, what we have. And then maybe, um, I don't know, Robert, how you would prefer to do it. Do you want people to just do the chat or do you want us to talk to one another? Uh, let's try just the chat for now, see what okay. we get. Uh, so Petra, uh, Joan and, and um, P uh, had comments about Bonnie Cashin. Uh, Joan mentioned that she actually had a Bonnie Cashin coat that she really loved. And uh, P mentions that um, Bonnie was well known for her clothes and jackets before she went to handbags. Yeah, so let's stop there for just a moment. Um, so I think anyone who has the option of owning a Bonnie Cashin um, is is very lucky. Um, and P's comment about her being well known for her clothes and jackets is absolutely correct. She worked with a company in Ohio called Sills. 
um, and she produced a, a wide range of clothing. She also was a costume designer um, in California before she um, went into business with Coach. And what is significant about Bonnie Cashin is that she was always independent. Um, she always worked for and contracted with companies. Um, she never licensed her name. Um, and so I think in some people's minds that made her difficult to work with, but it provided her with the flexibility to always be um, independent. Uh, Diane uh, wants to know if you had any information in your exhibition on Chanel, who I think I mentioned in the introduction. We do. So in one of the first slides, um, uh, there is a juxtaposition of Elsa Scaparelli with Chanel, which for me was kind of um, sort of a, a cheeky moment because they were known um, as rivals. Um, but I believe that throughout the installation, we have um, three ensembles by Chanel. One, um, her classic tweed um, skirt suit. One, a beautiful 1920s um, flapper style gown. And um, one from the 1960s, which is in our mini skirt section. Uh, Joanne says, thank you from some of us here tonight from the Boston chapter of the American Sewing Guild and the Rhode Island Sewing Network. So thank you for coming, Joanne. And Denise uh, similarly says, I'm from the Central Mass chapter of the American Sewing Guild. So glad that some of these uh, groups were able to join us. Um, Polly asks, oh, Polly, come on now. Uh, <laughs> well, it's funny. I, I will say that we do not have this, that particular work in our show. Um, although someone asked me about this actual jacket today, so it must be on people's minds. <laughs> okay, thank you for handling that one. Um, what is the estimated value of this collection? Um, well, it's hard to say because it's kind of coming from all over. So as I, as I mentioned, we have 60 pieces from the Dutch Museum. We have 25 of our own. Um, in some cases, they're invaluable. Um, you know, certainly the, the piece that is, uh, was worn by Mary Todd Lincoln is extremely rare um, and is, I would say, invaluable. Um, some of the other pieces, you know, we, we, trend, we tend to try not to think about them from monetary perspectives once they become a part of a museum's collection, um, because we want to treat, you know, a, a Rembrandt in the same um, manner and care as we would treat an old shoe, because it is in our care, um, and so we should value it the same. Um, but I can certainly say that, you know, with designer clothing, um, and in particular, you know, some of these pieces are quite exceptional. Um, I would say that the, the cultural and historical value is very high. Uh, we have a question here, can a, and again, I, mis, I mispronounce, I apologize, can a cashin leather jacket, which has gotten white spots and stains on it, be saved? Um, I guess it sort of depends on how bad it is, but I, I think it could be, um, you know, there are uh, dry cleaners who specialize um, in leather. Um, and, you know, I, when we, I'll go back to that slide, but I've also included my email address here. Um, and I'd be happy to point you in the direction of a conservator who might be able to give you a little bit more information. Uh, so yeah, I would, uh, so that would be great if you could uh, follow up with uh, Petra uh, individually via her email. Denise has a great question, good clarification question. Uh, Denise says the public view of this is from November 21st to, to March 14th. Is this visiting in person or a Zoom style meeting? Oh, so you are welcome to join us at the Peabody Essex Museum um, Thursdays through Sundays. Um, we just ask that you check the website first uh, to be sure that um, we've checked out all of our COVID protocols, um, but we absolutely intend um, and hope that people will view this exhibition in person. Um, but we will also, for people who cannot visit us from out of state, um, be progressing with um, or proceeding with the um, the documentation of this exhibition through technology called Matterport, which is basically a virtual or digital tour of the exhibition. Uh, Eve uh, mentions the evolution of women's undergarments are permit, uh, permitted many of these fashion revolutions. Are you familiar with suffragettes in corsets presentation by the Grounded Goodwife? 
I am not, but I'm absolutely going to make note of it and check that out. And you're right, undergarments definitely permitted many of the fashion revolutions. And Eve, I, I, am, I am familiar, have not seen the presentation, but I know several libraries who uh, hosted it and it's definitely on my uh, list. Uh, Diane wants to know, will a catalog for the exhibit be available? Yes. So the exhibition itself is entitled Made It, The Women Who Revolutionized Fashion, and the book that coincides with our exhibition is called The Women Who Revolutionized Fashion, 250 Years of Design. Great. Um, Petra, would you mind uh, giving out your email address one more time? Sure. Um, so here, I'll put it in the chat. Sure. That might be a little bit easier for people. Um, but it is Petra, P-E-T-R-A underscore, uh, S is in Sam, L-I-N-K-A-R-D at P-E-M dot O-R-G. Great. I think we have, with that, answered everyone's questions and addressed comments. Um, so uh, Petra, is there uh, any, and we're coming up on eight o'clock, so great timing. Uh, is there uh, any last words you wanna leave uh, with the group? Anything else you wanna say? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think I, I would say that, you know, if you have the opportunity to come and visit us in person, um, please do. Uh, I, I, I'm bouncing back and forth now between the museum and home. Um, but if you are in the museum and I'm there as well, I'd love to meet you in person. Um, I'm very excited to say that I think almost exclusively everyone who worked on this show from our exhibition designer to our graphic designer to all the people that dress the mannequins, our conservators, they're all women. Um, we didn't plan for that to be that way, but it just sort of worked out that way. So it's sort of a, a serendipitous um, uh, addition to our, our show. Um, and mostly, you know, I, I think I would like for people to take away, you know, that this is an exhibition, of course, that is limited by the number of mannequins that we can uh, include, the number of labels that people are willing to read. But in a no way is it a comprehensive survey of the impact that women um, have made in the fashion industry. But it is, I hope, a gateway uh, to get people to understand more how important fashion has been and continues to be in our society. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Petra. A lot of compliments in the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Most interesting. This was great. Thank you for doing this. Uh, fantastic presentation. You really know your stuff. Uh, also in the chat, I put a link to the library's uh, Museum Pass program page. And I would note that we do subscribe to the uh, Peabody Essex Museum um, Pass. Uh, pass admits two to general museum admission at a reduced fee of $12 per person. So uh, you can click the link and I know many of you are coming from outside of Tewksbury. So definitely check uh, your library's websites to see if it's uh, offered there as well. All right, so we will end it there. Uh, thank you so much, Petra. Uh, I thought you did a wonderful job and I really appreciate everyone for joining us here tonight. Let's give Petra a big virtual round of applause. <laughs> and uh, again, I remind folks to check their email tomorrow morning, uh, take 30 or 60 seconds and uh, fill out that feedback survey. So uh, thank you all so much and everyone have a wonderful night. Thank you, Robert. And thank so, you all. Thanks, Patriot.